Chapter 8 Trent After a time, he got up and walked on, into the dread world of the mundanes. It really did not look much different. The trees were similar, the rocks unchanged, and the ocean shore he paralleled was exactly like an ocean shore. Yet, an intense nostalgia gripped him. His prior euphoria had been but the swing of the pendulum, providing a false buoyancy. Better if he had died in the crossing. Well, he could still go back. Just step across the line. Death would be painless, and he could be buried in Xanth. Was that what other exiles had done? He revolted against the notion. He had called his own bluff. He loved Xanth and missed it terribly already. But he did not want to die. He would simply have to make his way among the mundanes. Others had surely done it before him. Maybe he could even be happy there. The isthmus was mountainous. Bink sweated as he climbed the steep pass. Was this the counterpart to the chasm? A ridge that rose as high above the land as the chasm sank beneath it? Did a ridge dragon run along the heights? No, not in Mundania. But possibly such geography did have something to do with the magic. If the magic quality washed down from the height, concentrating in the depth, no, that didn't seem to make much sense. Most of it would have washed into the ocean and been hopelessly diluted. For the first time, he wondered what Mundania was really like. Was it actually possible to survive without magic? It would not be nearly as nice as Xanth, but the absence of spells should represent a formidable challenge, and there should be some decent places in it. The people should not be evil. After all, his ancestors had come from mundane stock. Indications were that language and many customs were the same. He heaved himself over the rise of the pass, braced for his first real glimpse of the new world. And suddenly, he was surrounded by men. An ambush. Fink whirled to run. Maybe he could trick them into plunging into the shield and be rid of them the easy way. Not that he wanted to be responsible for their death. Anyhow, he had to try escaping them. But, as he turned, his body responding somewhat slower than his thoughts, he found a man behind him, blocking the way with drawn sword. The sensible thing to do was to give up. They had him outnumbered and surrounded, and they could have put an arrow into his back if they had wanted to kill him outright. All they wanted to do was rob him, he had almost nothing to lose. But being sensible had never been Bink's strong point. Not when he was under pressure or surprised. Reflecting after the fact, he was very sensible and intelligent. But that wasn't much use at this stage. If only he'd had a talent like that of his mother, only stronger so that he could turn time back a couple of hours and replay all his crises to better advantage. Bink charged the man with the sword, swinging his staff to block the blade. But someone tackled him, bringing him down hard before he took two steps. Bink's face struck the dirt, and he took a mouthful. Still, he fought twisting about to get at the man who held him. Then they were all on him, bearing him down. 
Fink had no chance. In moments, he was tied and gagged. A man thrust his tough face close to Bink's eyes as two others held him erect. Now get this, Xanth. If you try any magic, we'll knock you out and carry you. Magic? They didn't know that Bink had none he could use. Or that if he had, it would, do, it would be no good out here beyond the shield. But he nodded, showing he understood. Maybe they would treat him better if they thought he, would, he could somehow strike back. They marched him down the other side of the pass and to a military camp on the mainland beyond the isthmus. What was an army doing here? If it were an invasion of Xanth, it could not succeed. The shield would kill a thousand men as readily as one. They brought him to the main tent. Here, in a screened enclosure, sat a handsome man in his forties, wearing some sort of green mundane uniform, a sword, a neat mustache, and an emblem of command. Here is the spy, General, the sergeant said respectfully. The general glanced at Bink, appraising him. There was, a, was dismaying intelligence in that cool study. This was no bandit thug. Release him, he said quietly. He is obviously harmless. Yes, sir, the sergeant said respectfully. He untied Bink and removed his gag. Dismissed, the general murmured. And without a word, the soldiers were gone. They were clearly disciplined. Bink chafed at his wrists, trying to rub the pain out, amazed at the general's confidence. The man was well-formed, but not large. Finger Bink was younger and taller and surely stronger. If he acted quickly, he might escape. Bink crouched, ready to jump at the man and knock him down. Suddenly, the general's sword was in his hand, pointing at Bink. The man's draw had been a blur. The weapon had jumped to his hand as if by magic. But that obviously could not be the case here. I would not advise it, young man, the general said, as if warning him not to step on a thorn. Bink staggered, trying to break without falling on the point of the sword. He did not succeed. But as his chest bore on that blade, the sword retreated, returning to its scabbard. The general, now on his feet, caught Bink by his elbows and stood him back upright. There was such precision and power in the action that Bink knew he had grossly underestimated this man. He had no chance to overcome him, with or without the sword. Be seated, the general said mildly. Cowed, Fink moved awkwardly to the wooden chair and sat on it. Now he was conscious of his own dirty face and hands, the disorganization of his apparel, in contrast to the impeccably neatness of the general. Your name? Bink. He did not give his village, since he was no longer affiliated with it. What was the purpose of this question anyway? He was a non-entity, regardless of his name. I am the magician Trent. Perhaps you know of me. It took a moment for the import to register. Then Bink didn't believe it. Trent? He's gone. He was exiled twenty years ago. Precisely. But Trent was ugly, a monster, crazy. The magician smiled, 
showing none of these traits. What stories do they tell of me today in Xanth? Fink thought of Justin Tree. The fish of the stream turned to lightning bugs to harass the centaurs. The opponents who had been transformed to water forms and left to die on land. You... He was a power-hungry spellcaster who tried to usurp the throne of Xanth when I was but a child. An evil man whose evil still lives after him. Trent nodded. This is a kinder repute than is normally accorded the loser in a political contest. I was about your present age when I was banished. Perhaps our cases are similar. No, I never killed anyone. They accuse me of that, too. I transformed many, but I did that instead of killing. I have no need to kill, since I can render an enemy harmless by other means. A fish on land still dies. Oh, so that is how they put it. That would indeed be murder. I did transform enemies to fish, but always in water. On land, I utilized only land forms. Possibly some subsequently died, but that was the doing of predators in the normal course of nature. I never... I don't care. You abuse your magic. I am not like you at all. I had no magic. The fair eyebrow lifted expressively. No magic. Everybody in Xanth has magic. Because they exile those who don't have it, Bink said with a flash of bitterness. Trent smiled, and it was a surprisingly winning expression. Nevertheless, our interests may be parallel, Bink. How would you like to return with me to Xanth? For an instant, wild hope flared in his breast. Return? But immediately he quashed it. There is no return? Oh, I wouldn't say that. To every act of magic, there is a counter-magic. It is merely a matter of invoking it. You see, I have developed a counter to the shield. Again, Bink had to take stock of his reactions. If you had that, you could have gone into Xanth already. Well, there is a certain small problem of application. You see, what I have is an elixir distilled from a plant that grows on the very fringe of the magical zone. The magic extends somewhat beyond the shield, you understand. Otherwise, the shield itself wouldn't work, for it is magic and cannot operate beyond the magic domain. This plant, which seems to be of basically mundane stock, competes at the fringe with the magical plants of Xanth. It is very difficult to compete with magic, so it evolved a very special property. It suppresses magic. Do you appreciate the significance? Suppresses magic? Maybe that's what happened to me. Trent studied him with disquieting calculation. So, you feel you were wronged by the present administration? We do have something in common. Bink wanted no common ground with the evil magician. However, winning the man's aspect might be. He knew that evil would be put, could put on an extremely fair face. Otherwise, how would evil ever have survived in the world so long? 
What are you getting at? The shield is magic. Therefore, the elixir should nullify it. But it does not, because the source of the shield is not touched. It is necessary to reach the shield stone itself. Unfortunately, we do not know precisely where that stone is now. And there is not enough elixir to blanket the entire peninsula of Xanth, or even a significant fraction of it. Makes no difference, Fink said. Your knowing where the shield stone is would not bring it within your reach. Ah, but it would. You see, we have a catapult. With a sufficient range to drop a bomb anywhere in nearby Xanth. We have it mounted on a ship that can sail right around Xanth. So it is very likely that we could drop a container of elixir on the shield stone, if we only had the precise coordinates. Now, Fink understood. The shield would collapse, and my army would overrun Xanth. Of course, the magic dampening effect would be temporary for the elixir dissipates readily. But a mere ten minutes would suffice to get the bulk of my army across the line. I have been drilling the men in short and swift short-range maneuvers. After that, it would be merely a matter of time until the throne was mine. You would return us to the days of conquest and ravage, Fink said horrified. Thirteenth wave, worse than all the rest. By no means. My army is disciplined. We shall exert precisely that force that is necessary. No more. My magic will probably eliminate most resistance anyway. So, there need be very little violence. I do not wish to ruin the kingdom I am to rule. So you haven't changed, Fink said. You're still hungry for illicit power. Oh, I have changed, Trent assured him. I have become less naive, more educated and sophisticated. The mundanes have excellent educational facilities and a broader world view. And... They are ruthless politicians. I will not this time underestimate the determination of my opposition, or leave myself foolishly vulnerable. I have no doubt I will make a better king than I would have twenty years ago. Well, count me out. But I must count you in, Bink. You know where the shield stone is located. The evil magician leaned forward persuasively. It is important that the shot be precise. We have only a quarter pound of elixir, and that is a labor of two years' work. We have virtually denuded the fringe region of the source plants. Our supply is irreplaceable. We dare not guess at the location of the shield stone. We require a precise map, a map that only you can draw. So there it was. Trent had posted his men to ambush any travelers from Xanth so that they could update him on the precise position of the shield stone. That was the only piece of information the evil magician needed to initiate his wave of conquest. Bink had merely happened to be the first exile to walk into the trap. No, I won't tell you. I won't help overthrow 
the legitimate government of Xanth. Legitimacy is commonly defined after the fact, Brent remarked. Had I been successful 20 years ago, I would now be the legitimate king, and the present monarch would be a reviled outcast noted for drowning people irresponsibly. I presume the Storm King still governs? Yes, Fink said shortly. The evil magician might try to convince him that it all was merely palace politics, but he knew better. I am prepared to make you a very handsome offer, Bink. Virtually anything you might desire in Xanth. Wealth, authority, women. He had said the wrong thing. Bink turned away. He would not want Sabrina on that basis anyway, and he had already turned down what amounted to a similar offer by the sorceress Iris. Trent steepled his fingers. Even in that minor mannerism, there was implied power and ruthlessness. The magician's plans were too finely meshed to be balked by a willful exile. You may wonder why I choose to return to Xanth after two decades and evident success in Mundania. I have spent some time analyzing that myself. No, Fink said. But the man only smiled, refusing to be ruffled. And again, Fink had the uneasy feeling that he was being skillfully maneuvered that he was about to play into the hands of the magician, no matter how he tried to fight it. You should wonder, lest you allow your outlook to be unconscionably narrow, as mine was when I emerged from Xanth. Every young man should go abroad into the mundane world for a period of a year or two, at least. It would make him a better citizen of Xanth. Travel of any type tends to broaden one. Fink could not argue with that. He had learned a great deal in his two-week tour of Xanth. How much more would a year in Mundania teach him? In fact, the magician continued, When I assume power... I shall institute such a policy. Xanth cannot prosper cut off from the real world. In isolation is only stagnation. Bink could not restrain his morbid curiosity. The magician had intelligence and experience that appealed insidiously to Bink's own intellect. What is it? like out there. Do not speak with such distaste, young man. Mundania is not the evil place you may imagine. That is part of the reason the citizens of Xanth need more exposure to it. The ignorance of isolation breeds unwarranted hostility. Mundania is in many respects more advanced more civilized than Xanth. Deprived of the benefits of magic, the mundanes have had to compensate in ingenious ways. They have turned to philosophy, medicine, and science. They now have weapons called guns that can kill more readily than an arrow or even a deadly spell. I have trained my troops in other weapons because I do not wish to introduce guns into Xanth. They have carriages that carry them across the land as fast as a unicorn can run, and boats that row across the sea as swiftly as a sea serpent can swim, and balloons that take them as high in the air as a dragon can fly. They have people called doctors who heal the sick and wounded without the use of a single spell. 
and a device consisting of little beads on columns that multiplies figures with marvelous speed and accuracy. Ludicrous, Bink said. Even magic can't do figures for a person, unless it is a golem. And then it has really become a person. This is what I mean, Bink. Magic is marvelous, but it is also limited. In the long run, the instruments of the mundanes may have greater potential. Probably, the basic lifestyle of the mundanes is more comfortable than that of many Xants. There probably aren't as many of them, Fink muttered, though they have no competition for good land. On the contrary, there are many millions of people there. You're never going to convince me of anything telling such tall stories, Bink pointed out. The north village of Xanth has about 500 people, counting all the children, and that's the largest one. There can't be more than 2,000 people in the whole kingdom. You talk of thousands of thousands of people? But I know the mundane world can't be much larger than Xanth. The evil magician shook his head in mock sadness. Bink, bink. None so blind as those who will not see. And if they really have balloons flying through the air, carrying people, why haven't they flown them over Xanth? Bink demanded hotly, knowing he had the magician on the run. Because... They don't know where Xanth is, don't even believe it exists. They don't believe in magic, so... Don't believe in magic? The humor had never been very funny, and it was getting worse. The mundanes never did know very much about magic, Brent said seriously. It appears a great deal in their literature, but never in their daily lives. The shield has closed off the border, as it were, though no truly magic animal has been seen in Mundania in about a century, and it may be to our interest to keep them ignorant. He continued, frowning. If they ever get the notion Xanth is a threat to them, they might use a giant catapult to lob in firebombs. He broke off, shaking his head as though at some horrible thought. Fink had to admire the perfection of the mannerism, which was as apt as any his father, Roland, employed. He could almost believe there was some fantastic threat lurking. No, the magician concluded. The location of Xanth must remain secret for now. It won't remain secret if you send all Xanth youths into Mundania for two years. Oh, we would put an amnesia spell on them first, and revoke it only after they returned. Or, at least a guise of silence, so no mundane could learn from them about Xanth. Thus, they would acquire mundane experience to augment their Xanth magic. Some trusted ones would be permitted to retain their memories and freedom of speech outside, so they could act as liaisons, recruiting qualified colonists and keeping us informed, for our own safety and progress. But overall, the fourth wave again, Fink said, controlled colonization. Trent smiled. You are an apt pupil. Many citizens chose not to comprehend the true nature of the original colonization of Xanth. Actually, Xanth never was very easy to locate from Mundania, because it seems to have no fixed geographic location. 
Historically, people have colonized Xanth from all over the world, always walking across the land bridge directly from their own countries, and all would have sworn that they migrated only a few miles. Furthermore, all comprehended one another's speech in Xanth, though their original languages were entirely different. So it would appear that there is something magical about the approach to Xanth. Had I not kept meticulous notes of my route, I would never have found my way back this far. The mundane legends of the animals that departed from Xanth in bygone centuries show that they appeared all over the world, rather than, in, than at any specific site. So it seems to work in reverse, too. He shook his head as if it were a great mystery, and Bink was hard put to it not to become hopelessly intrigued by the concept. How could Xanth be everywhere at once? Did its magic extend, after all, beyond the peninsula? In some peculiar fashion? It would be easy to get hooked by the problem. If you like Mundania so well, why are you trying to get back into Xanth? Fink demanded, trying to distract himself from temptation by focusing on the magician's contradictions. I don't like Mundania, Trent said, frowning. I merely point out that it is not evil and that it has considerable potential, and must be reckoned with. If we do not keep aware of it, it may become aware of us, and that could destroy us, right along with itself. Xanth represents a haven like none other known to man, a provincial, backward haven to be sure, but there is no other place quite like it. And I, I am a magician. I belong in my land, with my people, protecting them from the horrors arising, which you are not equipped even to imagine. He lapsed into silence. Well, no mundane tales are going to make me tell you how to get into Xanth. The magician's eyes focused on Bink as if only now was he becoming aware of his presence. I would prefer not to have to employ coercion, Trent said softly. You know my talent. Bink felt a shiver of extremely ugly apprehension. Trent was the Transformer the one who changed men into trees, or worse, the most potent magician of the past generation, too dangerous to be allowed to remain in Xanth. Then he felt relief. You're bluffing, he said. Your magic can't work outside Xanth, and I'm not going to let you into Xanth. It is not very much of a bluff, Trent said evenly, the magic, as I mentioned, extends slightly beyond the shield. I can take you to that border and transform you into a toad, and I shall do it if I have to. Bink's relief tightened back into a knot in his stomach. Transformation the notion of losing his lifelong body without actually dying had an insidious horror. It terrified him. But he still could not betray his homeland. No, he said, his tongue feeling thick in his mouth. I don't understand, Bink. You surely did not leave Xanth voluntarily. I offer you the chance to get your own back. 
not that way. Trent sighed, with seemingly genuine regret. You are loyal to your principles, and I cannot fault you for that. I had hoped it would not come to this. Fink had hoped so too, but he seemed to have no choice, except to watch his chance to make a break for it, risking his life to escape. Better a clean death in combat than to become a toad. A soldier entered, reminding Bink faintly of Crombie, mainly a matter of bearing, not appearance, and stood at attention. What is it, Hastings? Trent inquired mildly. Sir, there is uh, another person through the shield. Trent hardly showed his elation. Really? It seems we have another source of information. Bink felt a new emotion, but hardly a comfortable one. If there were another exile from Xanth, the magician could get his information without Bink's help. Would he let Bink go? Or turn him into a toad anyway, as an object lesson? Remembering Trent's reputation of past times, Bink had little confidence that he would be freed. Anyone who balked the evil magician, in whatever trifling manner, was in for it. Unless Bink gave him the information now, redeeming himself. Should he? Since it could make no difference to the future of Xanth? He saw Trent pausing, looking at him expectantly. Suddenly, Bink caught on. This was a setup, a faint announcement to make him talk, and he had almost fallen for it. Well, you won't be needing me then, Bink said. One thing about being turned into a toad, he couldn't tell the magician anything at all in that form. He imagined a potential dialogue between man and toad. Magician, where is the shield stone? Toad, rock! Bink almost smiled. Bink would transform him only as a last resort. Now, Trent returned to the messenger. Bring the other one here. I will question him immediately. Sir, it is a woman. A woman? Trent seemed mildly surprised, but Bink was amazed. This was not what he expected in a bluff. There was certainly no woman being exiled, and no man either. What was Trent trying to do? Unless... Oh no. Unless Sabrina had, after all, followed him out. Dismay tore at him. If the evil magician had her in his power... No, it could not be. Sabrina did not really love him. The exile and her reaction to it had proved that. She would not give up all she had to follow him out. It simply was not in her nature. And he didn't really love her. He had already decided that. So this had to be a complex ruse on the part of the magician. Very well. Bring her in, Trent said. It couldn't be a bluff then. Not if they actually brought her in. And if it were Sabrina, it couldn't be. He was quite absolutely positively certain of that. Or was he projecting, attributing his own attitudes to her? How could he really know what was in her heart? If she had followed him, couldn't let her be changed into a toad. Yet with all of Xanth at stake, Bink threw up his hands mentally. He would just have to play it as it came. 
If they had Sabrina, he was lost. If it were an ingenious bluff, he had won, except that he would be a toad. Perhaps being a toad would not be so bad. No doubt flies would taste very good, and the lady toads would look as good as human girls did now. Maybe the great love of his life was waiting in the grass, warts and all. The ambush detail arrived, half carrying a struggling woman. Bink saw with relief that it was not Sabrina, but a marvelously ugly female he had never seen before. Her hair was wild, her teeth gnarled, her body sexually shapeless. Stand, Trent said mildly, and she stood, responsive to his easy air of command. Your name? Fanchen, she said rebelliously. Yours? The magician Trent. Never heard of you. Bink, caught by surprise, had to cough to conceal his snort of laughter, but Trent was unperturbed. This puts us on an even footing, Fanchin. I regret the inconvenience my men have caused you. If you will kindly inform me of the location of the shield stone, I shall pay you well and send you on your way. Don't tell him, Bink cried. He means to invade Xanth. She wrinkled her bulbous nose. What do I care about Xanth? She squinted at Trent. I could tell you. How do I know I can trust you? You might kill me as soon as you had your information. Trent tapped his long, aristocratic fingers together. This is a legitimate concern. You have no way of knowing whether my given word is good. Yet, it should be obvious that I should bear no malice to those who assist me in the pursuit of my objectives. All right, she said. Makes sense. The shield stone is at... Traitor! Fink screamed. Remove him! Trent snapped. Soldiers entered and grabbed him and hustled him out. He had accomplished nothing except to make it harder for himself. But then he thought of another aspect. What were the chances of another exile coming from Xanth within an hour after him? There couldn't be more than one or two exiles a year. It was big news when anyone left Xanth. He had heard nothing about it, and no second trial had been scheduled. So, Fanchin was not an exile. She was probably not from Xanth at all. She was an agent, planted by Trent just as Bink had first suspected. Her purpose was to convince Bink that she was telling Trent the location of the shield stone, tricking him into confirming it. Well, he had figured out the scheme, and so he had won. Do what he might, Trent would not get into Xanth. Yet, there was a nagging uncertainty.